Kia ora koutou and welcome to the fourth of our Leading for Wellbeing webinar series. I'm Rachel Preble, I'm the Organisation Development Manager at Kapila Coast District Health Board and I'm a member of Kahui Oranga, which is the national collaborative working to, uh, to support the wellbeing of our health workforces. We've created this webinar series uh, in the hope that these conversations will inspire, inform and empower you in your Leading for Wellbeing. A reminder that you can submit questions via the chat function throughout the webinar today and a recording of this webinar and the previous webinars in the series will be available on the website wellbeingforhealth.co.nz. So today we're focusing on leading for health and safety and I'm joined by three remarkable women. First up I'd like to introduce you to Sue McCulloch. Sue is the National DHB Coordinator for the Public Service Association, Te Pukenga Hire Tikanga Mahi, and is a member of Kahui Oranga with me. Kia ora. Kia ora. And next we have Shannon Lowe. Shannon is a radiation therapist at the Wellington Blood and Cancer Centre and is a uh, health and safety representative and also a manual training, a manual handling trainer. Kia ora, Shannon. Kia ora. And finally, I've got Catherine Etz next to me, and she's the General Manager of Health and Technical Services for WorkSafe New Zealand. She's held senior leadership roles in both public and private health organisations, and including was the Executive Director of Allied Health Scientific and Technical at Kapilin Coast District Health Board, Kira. Kira. So the legal framework for health and safety is outlined in the Health and Safety Act 2015, and that sets out the expectations and the responsibilities of businesses and workers to manage health and safety. But today we want to talk not just about the legal requirement, but thinking more about what's the right thing to do. Everyone who goes to work should come home healthy and safe. We all have a role to play in leading for health and safety, and our panel today reflect a range of health and safety leadership perspectives. Safety is a shared responsibility. We're all accountable for the safety of our patients and of each other. And no matter what our role is or our position, we all lead for safety in our day-to-day -day work. It's worth taking a little moment to differentiate safety leadership from safety management. When we talk about safety management, that tends us towards conversations about checklists, about compliance, about surveillance, and about sanctions for non-compliance. But we would really today like to shift the conversation and focus on what leading for safety looks like, how we as leaders can harness the potential of our workforces who are the experts in safety in day-to-day -day work, and they can help us to identify and to achieve a safety culture. I'm interested to reflect a little because there's been quite a lot of evolution in the conversation around health and safety in recent years. In particular, there's been an increasing focus on recognising potential psychosocial hazards in the health sector and what this means in terms of ensuring wellbeing. So I'm going to start with Catherine. When you reflect over your career, first as a health professional, then uh, working as in leadership and now at WorkSafe, what have you observed in terms of change over that time? Well, you're right. Uh, there has been considerable change over the last few years in this area. When I was a newly qualified speech language therapist, chemical governance was coming to the fore and we had an extensive focus on the impact and the effects of, and the effectiveness of our clinical practice, um, which was threatening to many to actually be diving in and understanding and comparing and peer reviewing what work looked like. Um, after just a few years, the conversation moved on and we talked more about concepts of compassion fatigue, self-care, um, both as leaders and as health practitioners. And now, of course, just in more recent times, we re uh, reference resilient systems, talking about ways of working together to protect and, and ensure health and safety in the way that we work. So really taking that focus out to the system level and mm. thinking about the interactions mm. that support that. So Sue, over your time working with the PSA, what would you say have been the key changes, particularly in terms of the union role uh, in strengthening health and safety across the health sector? Uh, well, for the unions, it's a highly, highly unionised workplace that we're in DHBs in the health system generally. So it's about the collectivism and making sure that the worker has a voice within that system. And so we've gradually been building up the bipartite and tripartite frameworks that enable that voice at a national level, but also at a local level, looking at the building on the health and safety committees and making sure our health and safety workers 
are engaged in that process, but also that they have good work safe rep training and feel enabled and confident to go out there in the workplace and raise their issues and speak out about health and safety. So starting to build a culture around safety and that's a key concept that has come into the conversation over the last few years um, is that real focus on how on people and how they interact and the role that people play in creating a safety culture and culture as an idea can be a bit hard to define but it's often talked about in terms of the behaviors that we would see day to day the shared beliefs and values and often people will use the phrase oh the way things are done around here or the way we work around here and I'm interested, so when you think about that idea of a, a strong safety culture, what does that look like for you? The health and safety is what we do. It's on the agenda at every meeting. It's not just something that's an add-on, but something that people focus on and see as the really important thing. But from a, again, from a union point of view, we can focus on the worker within health and safety. You were saying earlier about the, the worker's voice or the patient being the centre of the the health and safety. Mm -hmm. It is about melding the two and making sure that the whole system is healthy and safe for people to be able to work and, and enjoy being in the workplace and supported in the workplace. And THBs are quite hierarchical, so it's important that we make sure that people be, feel enabled to speak out and raise issues of concern so that it is a safe workplace for me. And for you, Catherine? Mm -hmm. So for me, a good safety culture and a good organisational culture are very similar. Um, so what I think both have in terms of being a good culture is the assurance that you will uh, be heard um, and that you uh, feel trusted with, with what you're contributing uh, and respected. But of course, that works the other way around too. And it's really important that we hear the views of others, um, that we trust and respect the issues that other people raise too. So really creating that um, safe place for people to raise concerns, to speak up and to be part of the solution. Part of the well, solution. Really yeah. yeah, yeah. So Shannon, as a health and safety rep and frontline worker, what have you observed in terms of what makes a strong safety culture? Um, so as a radiation therapist, um, I think a strong safety culture requires quite clear communication. Um, as we kind of outlined before, we are very patient orientated in, sort of in terms of communicating with patients and their um, whanau and families. However, also between staff and our managers, is communication is also very important. Um, it's about being transparent if issues do come up. So especially when we're having staff meetings, health and safety being on the agenda, being transparent of issues that have come up. Um, and the more we talk about it and the more we do speak up, um, see something, say something, do something, um, the more normalised it becomes and um, the more hopefully solution-based we can become as well. Yeah, so definitely I really, communication. I really like that phrase, see something. What was it? Yeah. See something, say something, do, do something. something. Yes. That's Just great. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So 2020 has indeed been a really challenging year for everyone and it's certainly brought into sharp relief the importance of being safe and being healthy at work. So in our previous webinars in the series, we started off exploring the importance of looking after yourself uh, and your own well-being in order to lead effectively. Then we uh, explored some ideas about how you can support uh, and lead for well-being with a diverse team. And the most recent conversation discussed psychological safety, what it is, how it feels, and how we as leaders can strengthen, uh, strengthen it in our, in our workplaces. One of the observations I would make is that, um, and, and I think the research efforts are now starting to really support that, is that teams that have maintained a really strong focus on wellbeing and who've continued to connect and to support each other, uh, the teams that have survived perhaps the most intact through uh, this COVID experience, mm -hmm. and in some cases actually even thrived in that context. The teams that have been most resilient through this period are those that have got strong and compassionate leaders and who are able to balance operational service delivery with maintaining the well-being of the team. And having said that, I don't want to uh, underestimate or minimise the very real challenges that many of our workforces and many of our leaders are facing at this time and the impact that those challenges have had on our psychosocial well-being. Um, maintaining that balance is really tricky. It takes a lot of energy and it takes uh, a lot of our resolve at times and resilience. And particularly because we are all navigating our way through uncertain times and unknown waters. 
Shannon, I'm going to come back to you. Working uh, in your team and in your context, what have been the key challenges that have come forward for you guys during 2020? Um, so, of course, as you highlighted before, COVID um, has caused such a big disruption to not only the workplace um, culture, but also um, home life as well, whether you have families who have been directly affected or indirectly affected. Um, yes, it's certainly a very big learning experience for us all. Um, however, in our department, of course, we still need to um, continually treat our patients as they've already undergone prior to um, the lockdown changes. And that requires um, a lot of trust in patients, actually, to leave their bubbles, to come into a um, potentially hazardous or uncertain environment in the hospital, um, and to let us deliver um, our gold standard um, practice, essentially, and treating them. Um, so yeah, again, it kind of flows back to the conversation of um, how great, uh, important communication is, not between us, but between the um, patients and their family as well. Um, so yeah, that's a very big challenge that we're all still learning, um, and hopefully we'll just improve. Yeah, definitely. So have you noticed different issues coming through from your delegates? Have, what have the key issues been? This year. Certainly with COVID there's been huge issues in, in the workplace if we think initially of the uh, personal protective equipment, ability for people to get that equipment and use that equipment effectively um, and across the health continuum we did have some challenges with that and again because of the hierarchical structure within BHBs it's making sure that everybody has the ability to get that equipment so it's not just you see the doctors and the nurses on the ward, we had a lot of concerns from the admin people who were at the front of the ward who didn't necessarily have the access to the equipment. And that then creates issues for them, fear and concern that they see somebody else needs something, why don't they? So it's about making sure that you listen to those concerns and, and make sure people are enabled. It's also about um, people moving out of the workplace and working from home so you have a whole new area to consider uh, thinking about setting up your workplace so your chairs right your tables right mm -hmm. enabling people to do that but also thinking about the impact on that when they have families at home young children who see them at home think great i can I'm be with them play with them <laughs> and they're saying no i've got to do this or elderly relatives who are living at home so all those things that are new to the work environment and making sure people are still secure and then keeping them as part of the team and making sure it's a high trust environment so that you know that they can do their work at home and enable them in every way to do their work at home and then coming back into the workplace and thinking about the concerns they have about family members who may be at risk and and pressure that's put on people because of that but also working in the environment again, close contact with other people. And some people enjoy the isolation, some people thrive on being together. So everybody has a different reaction to how the workplace is been. And that's quite important, having those conversations and making sure it's an engaged conversation. Not everybody needs the same things. And it comes back to the conversation we had uh, two webinars ago about uh, the in inclusive leadership. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that you're actually having those conversations and hearing the different perspectives and the different yeah. needs for different people. Yeah. yeah, it's certainly been a year, hasn't it? Definitely has. <laughs> Catherine, has it led to a change in the conversations at both at WorkSafe and across with mm -hmm. partners across the health system? Yeah, I mean, you're right. What a huge year it's been um, and not one that we'll forget in a hurry. I think the calls at a national level uh, from the Prime Minister even about kindness will have uh, penetrated our thinking and, and how we work and will withstand um, the ongoing challenges, I'm sure, of, of the pandemic. WorkSafe in itself is uh, developing its relationships across the health system. Uh, part of that has been as a result of COVID-19 and then partly because we are building our knowledge and expertise in terms of regulating um, work uh, as it impacts our health. Um, this particularly includes a focus on psychosocial risks that we're discussing today um, and musculoskeletal disorders, which is another key challenge for those who work in the health sector. So given the really unusual circumstances that we've all found ourselves in this year and the dynamics that you've um, all alluded to, I guess it'd be interesting to explore a little bit. Um, Catherine, I'll ask you, what do we as leaders um, need to think about in terms of strengthening in order to effectively respond to those challenges and to keep our people safe? Well, 
I'd like to start by um, having a big shout out and a thank you to all of those who've used their leadership skills to really authentically engage with their teams and uh, workers to ensure that we are talking about work as it's done um, and experienced rather than just workers um, it may be planned or monitored or measured. It's really important to work in partnership with many others and ensuring these conversations um, about health and safety happen so that others are able to participate. Those two, partnership and participation, are both critical for success. I think the focus of the health sector on patient safety and quality of care can mean that worker safety doesn't always appear as prominently as it should, um, when in reality, for me, they're inseparable. So uh, worker safety, patient quality of care, um, and now infection prevention and control should all be woven together in, in terms of our systems and our processes and the way we work. So gosh, you've covered some really, um, really important things there, and I'd like to take a little bit of time to unpack those. Um, one at a time. Um, so let's first have a think about partnership and what that means. And I'm going to come to you first, Sue. The concept of partnership is really core to the relationship between unions and employers and workers. And I guess it'd be really interesting to hear from us. Uh, what are some of the things that you do as a union organiser in order to ensure that those relationships are really positive and really strong? Yeah, it is a really important party point you raised, Catherine, that it's important that the workers are healthy and well, because if they are, they will support the patient. If the worker's sick, then they can't support the patient. So that's a key focus. And it's about engagement at all different levels. So not just working within the small team that you're in, but looking at the wider teams that you're in. And then the, the whole DHB, having that conversation at all different levels and showing, well, if we encourage our health and safety reps to be able to, to raise their concerns, then that means that we can move forwards and um, make a difference in the workplace and make it a safe workplace for everybody, not just for the patients, but for the, the individuals who are working there. That's a key issue to make sure people feel safe and good and get home safely. Yeah. So Shannon, in your role, what does partnership look like? And I think particularly um, for all of us who are in people leadership roles, it's really interesting to understand a little bit about how we can work really well in partnership with you as a health and safety rep. Yes, um, I think it's quite interesting the um, relationships we develop or can develop between our managers as a health and safety rep. Um, generally, we are, you know, help implementing or um, facilitating new techniques or new ideas to improve health and safety. Um, but of course, the opposite can happen. We can approach our managers with um, issues that staff have come to us or really um, difficult challenges um, such as PPE access and, mm -hmm. and things like that that have come to be quite emphasised during this COVID era. Um, so sometimes when approaching ideas, we need to be more solution based, I think, rather than problem focused um, so that we can utilise our time. This time is such a limited resource mm -hmm. in the clinical environment as well. Um, so it means maybe we need to consult with other colleagues or other specialties to see um, what the current best practice is and how we can utilise their ideas and adapt it to our um, specialties as well to improve the way we, we can do things. Um, so really it does emphasise the um, idea of being proactive and um, making sure that you are speaking out or um, if you're not speaking out, even sending an email or using other means of communicating what could be um, a challenge and how we could solve it. So what I'm hearing is what a valuable resource our health and safety reps are <laughs> and how as people leaders we should be really making, <laughs> making the most of them. Um, and that's through making sure we create opportunities to have those conversations, right, and, yes. and be able to hear and, um, and discuss and to get the benefit of all those one, that wonderful energy and uh, enthusiasm. So the second element you mentioned, Catherine, was around participation. And I guess it'd uh, be really interesting to hear a little bit more about uh, why you believe that's really important and what the benefits are of building and strengthening participation for our leaders and our teams. So the expert on how a role is done um, has to be the person who's doing the role and the work themselves. So as leaders, whilst we might observe and see and understand uh, the role, actually um, it's really important to ensure that the person who's doing the work participates in the conversations about their work, both to ensure that they contribute their expertise to discussions about their health and their safety, um, and also 
to build participation. So both across and within teams, we then create a collaborative approach over time to change um, how health and safety works um, and to ensure that our people are engaged in their work and then, as you say, able to thrive. So Shannon, how do people participate uh, and contribute in your team? And, and what role do you have as a health and safety rep in, in, in that piece, in the participation piece? Um, I think health and safety is such a diverse area. There's um, perhaps some substances, manual handling, uh, psychosocial, um, mental health, mental awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so diverse. Um, whereas I've kind of sub-specialised into the manual handling aspect as a manual handling educator. And of course we know that that affects a lot of our nursing staff. Um, allied health um, and just in general clinical practice, moving and handling is a very big issue. Um, so it's promoting and, um, and underlining and emphasising the staff safety will um, also be encouraging staff safety will only improve patient safety as well. And I think as long as we had that idea or promote that idea, um, staff will be able to do a kind of a risk assessment on what we can do to make things better in the workplace or in our um, workplace culture and things like that. So as a manual handling educator, we have um, our slogan, Te Wahi Te Karanga, which means our house or our place and our way of doing things. So our way of doing things is we want to promote safety for everybody, not just um, patients and whanau, but our frontline workers um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. So, so a really cool tenet of the union movement in the PSA is worker participation. How does that work in practice when it comes to health and safety? And what thoughts do you have for our leaders in terms of how they can make it easy for staff to participate in keeping everyone safe? It is a real challenge, especially when we have short staffing to enable our health and safety reps to be able to go out there in the workplace and support and respond to health and safety. I suppose it's seeing that health and safety is something that everybody's involved in they can go to the health and safety rep to um, raise issues, but everybody should be looking at health and safety and engaging in health and safety. You can't leave it to the health and safety reps to be able to, yeah. to do that work. But it's a key thing, making sure that people are enabled to have the time. And it, it's having the passion as well, if you're a health and safety rep, that you want to do that role. And it's not just, uh, this can be part of your role. It's somebody who puts themselves forwards, gets elected to be in that position and really wants to do that and has the passion to do it. So enabling that and supporting that is a key thing for participation. Yeah, it's really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and to give that confidence, doesn't it, to be innovative and to yeah. have those new ideas mm -hmm. coming forward. So another element that we've talked about throughout today actually is that focus on teams and on systems. And when I think about my workplace, which is at a relatively large DHB, it's, a, it's amazing the variation in teams depending on context and depending on culture. Uh, so I think it's a really fascinating thing to think about in the context of health and safety. Um, so Catherine, when you think about health and safety, what do leaders need to be aware of in terms of focusing on teams when they're creating a strong sure. safety culture? So sometimes, as you say, it's hard when so many things are coming at leaders. The list can be long. Yep. Um, the important thing is not to see health and safety as yet another obligation and a box to tick. Um, as, a busy, as a busy leader, um, it's important to inculcate um, health and safety into everything that we do so that we focus on achieving better work and delivering better work um, as a team or as an organisation. So as health professionals, care of others is our business. And so we can't do it unless we are caring for ourselves. And we know that leaders set the culture. So I think this is key to some of the answers that we've talked about today. A strong safety culture will flow from leaders. So their attitudes, their behaviours and their practice all uh, set the tone for how health and safety works in those teams. Mm. And how the whole team uh, sees themselves in, that, in, that, mm. uh, in their role. Um, so Shannon, what do you, um, what does your team find helpful in terms of maintaining health and safety together and for each other? I think, um, as was outlined before, health and safety is not just the reps, it's everyone's business. You know, everyone should be um, uh, a bit proactive about it, if possible, of course. Um, I think in my team that the best way is starting with the discussion. Um, and that can be done in multiple ways, actually, whether that be individual one-on-one -on -one discussion or group discussion. 
um, or if someone may, may want to email me or uh, we put out a survey or thing, things like that. Um, that gives both the introverts and the extroverts um, a chance to basically utilise the way that they communicate best. Um, and of course, everyone along that whole spectrum will be able to decide on what's best for them to um, share their ideas. Um, so it may, just makes that um, a, a, little, a little bit more easy to be more transparent about any challenges that they have come across. And so everyone can feel like they have a voice as well. And um, if someone feels like they have a voice, they're more likely to be engaging, to participate and to contribute as well. Be part of the team. Yes. Now we've just had a question come in on the chat and it's a very practical one, it's for you Shannon. You. Um, so the question is how much time is needed to be an effective health and safety vet? Um, mm. There definitely is a lot of time that you do need to um, basically input into being a health and safety vet. And I think at the start, when I was first, um, I guess, elected, it's a very, quite a steep learning curve. You have a lot of new terminologies that you need to understand, PCBU, Health and Safety Work Act. Um, so we got given the Work Act itself and I had a flip through and I thought, wow, this is, this is <laughs> a lot to deconstruct. <laughs> um, but as you get more exposure and um, more things that you are learning, you find it a lot more easier to process um, and new challenges to find a solution as well. And as you grow your network, you can actually think, oh, this would be really helpful if I can have this person's input or the union's input or this manager's specific input um, to be more solution-based rather than just um, problem-focused, which um, can be a very big hindrance at times. So solution, 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 solution. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like expect that you're going to need to invest a little bit of a little bit of extra time up front to let your um, health and safety representative find their feet yeah. and learn the new language and concepts, and then it's it's going to be some time ongoing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not something that you can kind of just pull out once a month and then put away again. Mm. It's got to be an ongoing and woven into the way that you're working it's as well, I imagine. Point. So I'm interested um, so to hear from you a little bit about what we could potentially learn from team uh, from the team approach that unions take um, in terms of how we how we strengthen that team approach to health and safety. Yeah, I think uh, what DHB workers do very well is work in teams. So it's a core of what they need to do to ensure that the patient is treated well. Um, and from a union point of view, we have lots of different teams. We come from the outside looking into the DHBs, we look into lots of different areas. So we bring a team approach of lots of different points of view, variety of views into that workplace. But I think it's really important not just to think of your core team, but think of the wider teams as well. So you might have a team of radiation therapists, but then you have the cancer team, and then you have the, the wider team within the DHB. And it's something that I think we did very well with COVID that we thought of as, as a team of five million. Once you're including people mm. in the team, you start talking to those people yeah. and engaging with those people and don't forget about them. Quite often in DHBs, we find some groups are missed out because they're not considered part of that core team. We need to expand the view of teams and, and work together to make sure everybody has that voice. And uh, listening to that range of voices is really important as well so it's not just everybody agreeing but having the challenging voices in that team to, mm -hmm. to yeah. make you think about what you're doing yeah you're not just going along with what everybody wants to do because so it's the easiest giving way. you a little poke yep, every now and again definitely. to challenge you to, to best practice so along with teams you mentioned systems Catherine and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more of your thoughts on that okay there's, there's lots we could say about systems I wonder whether in this context today we talk about joining the dots. So um, are we joining the dots, as I mentioned earlier, in the way that we need to weave our thinking together across patient safety, infection prevention and control, health and safety for our, our people? So are we having conversations then about the health workforce supply shortages when we can't find somebody to fill jobs in relation then to the well-being of workers? Are we turning a blind eye to burnout or compassion fatigue? And, um, it, you know, one of the system level conversations to try and find the big solutions. Um, it's great hearing Shannon's stories. Some of the um, hardest things to solve, I think, in health and safety are some of the things that need lots of people to solve them together. Okay. And that for me is, is how the system needs to come together. I think it's, uh, they call them gnarly problems, don't they? When you've got to start pulling all sorts of perspectives in 
and, and work your way through. It's not just a straightforward uh, solution that presents itself. So have you got thoughts around the role that safety systems play in supporting health and safety? It's about making sure they're open and transparent. If you raise a health and safety issue, you need to see the journey of that issue to the outcome of it, rather than putting a description into a box and that's it, you don't see any outcome. So it's really important that you're thinking about what the solutions could be as part of that problem, but you hear back. So it's about the, the loop of health and safety. And it's also about um, thinking, um, my mind's just gone there. Um, thinking about how you can get that bigger engagement with those issues as you're going forwards, but a learning process as well. If we have health and safety issues and nobody learns from it, it's treated more as a, ah, you've done something wrong, we yep. won't learn, we won't make the system healthier. So it's about making every opportunity a learning opportunity so that we can move forwards. And I think leaders have a, we have a particular responsibility for both of those things, don't we, in terms of we are often the person that can do the feedback, that knows the whole picture, can yeah. find out what has happened to something that might have otherwise feel like it's gone off into that black hole. Mm -hmm. And we also, are, are, we're the culture, right, as you said before, we lead in the way that we act. Um, Shannon, one last question, because we're nearly out of time. Um, as someone who's developing and employing safety systems on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you think are the key ingredients for a successful safety system? Um, yes, highlighting on the points that we just um, highlight, um, said, actually, the solutions as well, um, we're also different. Um, the way we approach to treating patients is the individuals, and the staff, we're individuals too, so a solution for one person um, may not be the exact same for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important um, to highlight. And I think, um, of course, with COVID, um, I've been tuning into the local CCD, CCDHB um, email updates, as well as the National Ministry of Health um, updates every day at 1pm. So it, it highlights the uh, impact that social media has mm -hmm. in the um, uh, how quickly information can be distributed these days. Um, so, of course, we want to ensure that we are quite um, effective in how we distribute our information um, and be trust, like, distribute trustworthy information as well from a reliable source um, and also be easily accessed so that if we are implementing new safety measures, um, everyone is able to access that and able to implement it into their portfolios. Yeah. Cool. So, all through today, I think we've had a really clear theme around communication, around um, including people in the conversation about really thinking about how we do join the dots so that we can see it, say it, do it. <laughs> um, we're at the end of our time and I'd like to thank Catherine, Sue and Shannon for joining me today. It's been, I hope you've found it a really useful and interesting conversation. I know I have and I've got a new catchphrase. <laughs> it's always awesome to come away with. Um, in these unprecedented times, we are all as leaders constantly learning and adapting. We've just been talking about the need for a learning, uh, a learning culture. And you as our leaders are also constantly learning and adapting. And we do want to just take a, a quick moment to formally recognise the contribution that you make as leaders. Thank you for everything that you do and for the energy that you bring. Enohora.